Welcome to Art and Objects, final major art catalogue for 2013. It's been a really busy year, some really interesting collections, and we're thrilled to be able to finish with a wonderful catalogue. This catalogue is really notable for three key bodies of work by Pat Hanley, Ted Bullmore, and Colin McCann. It's very rare for us to be able to offer concentrated selections of some of our major New Zealand artists, so we're really pleased to be able to offer such comprehensive selections in this catalogue. We also have some wonderful contemporary works, which we're going to talk to in just a second. Now, all of the works are currently on view, and on, of course, on view this weekend from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday and Tuesday. The auction is this coming Tuesday, the 26th of November, at 6.30 p.m. As Hamish mentioned, we are very fortunate in this catalogue to have two or three concentrated bodies of work by three artists of perhaps varying stature, but uh, nonetheless I think of three of our most important artists and all centred around the 1960s and 1970s. That's a real strength of the catalogue and uh, hopefully those of you who have seen the catalogue are enjoying it. I think there's a real attempt on our behalf to put more content into these auction catalogues. I think auction catalogues are always going to effectively be tools for selling. But we're really trying to, I guess, force you to engage with them more. We're very grateful in this instance to, uh, to Gil Hanley and to the Hanley family for uh, giving us access to one of some of these uh, wonderful archival images. We hope you enjoy them and uh, we're also very grateful to Gregory O'Brien who's given us a wonderful uh, essay and insight beyond a normal auction catalogue entry into the work of Pat Hanley. I'll start, I think, with Colin McCann. I think we're really lucky in this sale to have you know, four or five McCanns, which I think a testament to really the one constant in McCann's work. There's so many diverse bodies of work and uh, the artist seems to move so, so quickly. But really at the heart of McCann's practice, right throughout his entire earth, is the land, is the New Zealand landscape. This beautiful little work here from 1978-79 comes from the, a series of about 20 paintings called The Truth from King Country, Load-Bearing Structures. The artist packs one heck of a punch into this really concentrated little painting. I think the work gets its, its strength from the darkness and the monumentality of this T structure here, this tower cross, um, almost as ancient as civilization itself, sort of transposed onto the King Country landscape. What I love about this painting so much is that despite the fact it's so small, McCann just visibly pours over the surface and you might not think of McCann as the most beautifully finessed and detailed painter, but I think if you look closely at this painting, it might change your mind. The second and final of the, I think there's five McCann works in the catalogue um, that I'll talk about today, is this beautiful and incredibly elemental landscape called South Canterbury, closely related, of course, to the North Otago series, and done in 1968. There's only five or six of these South Canterbury landscape paintings in existence, according to the database. I love these paintings because I think What's really important about them is, is the way that McCann sees the land like no one else. We've got wonderful examples in this catalogue from Wollaston and Rita Angus as well. And I think if you look at them all together, you get what's truly unique and what's truly special about McCann's work. That stripping all that is superfluous from the land, that breaking it down to its bare bones, to its bare essentials, so that all you have left really is just the landscape in its purest form sort of verdant green here of the foreground, the middle strip there of the Southern Alps, of course, and then this sort of uh, parched, sunburnt sky. Just a really, really classic, beautiful McCann. Ted Bullmore's journey from New Zealand of the 1950s, the post-war years, to swinging London in the 1960s, uh, has resulted in one of the most extraordinary bodies of work, uh, I think, that has been produced uh, in New Zealand art history. Bullmore began life uh, as an artist. He was also a really great rugby player and his early fame was as a rugby player on the playing fields of New Zealand. But he began his artistic life as quite a traditional and highly skilled easel painter. And the earlier work in the catalogue, Yasuko, is a classic example of the early phase of Bullmore's production. And this work here, Astroform 1B, from uh, the late 1960s, is a really signature example of these works which sit in the nexus of sculpture, surrealism uh, and painting. So these types of works caught the eye of the great uh, film director Stanley Kubrick uh, and as we know the rest is history. There's a wonderful essay in the catalogue about these works uh, which I recommend that you read and this work here 
uh, with its shaping, its painting, its shield-like structure, the mixture of found objects, the wooden elements, all meld together uh, into a really striking relief sculpture. Really quite an extraordinary work and I really urge you to come down and have a look at it. In our first uh, important paintings catalogue of, of the year, we were fortunate enough to have a wonderful body of uh, paintings from Gordon Walters, including five from the artist's estate. This time, we're turning our focus on another very major New Zealand painter, Pat Hanley. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of offering several uh, great paintings, and I definitely count this particular work among the masterpieces that have come through these doors. It is Hanley in all his glory. From 1973, it's called Golden Age. I think when you, when you think about Hanley, you really must think of him as our foremost colorist. This is a testimony to that. We've got the most wonderfully bright, lurid palette of uh, gold and red, blues, and also work is just so painterly. Conceived on hardboard, it's a tour de force of the many techniques that the artist employed throughout his career. We've got paint applied on with brush, paint dripped, paint poured. It is uh, full of the joy de vivre of uh, Pat Hanley, his life and his art. Yeah, this wondrous object next to me here is by Australian sculptress Patricia Piccinini. Piccinini's work uh, has been seen as part of a major exhibition in 2005 in New Zealand entitled In Another Life. And this particular work here from the Cycle Pups series called Afterburner was one of the key works in that exhibition at the City Gallery in Wellington. It is really a quite an extraordinary object that, that almost defies words. It's a puppy. It represents the nascent early form, the juvenile form of what is ultimately going to become uh, another creature. But here she is playing with the technology and the finishes of the motorcycle, of the vehicle, the automotive paint finishes, and this extraordinarily well put together seat, if you like, and exhaust. But it's another thing. It's a hybrid. And Piccinini's uh, approach, as we see across her career, is to posit the human with the cyborg, if you like, with the other. So we see a number of sculptures of hers which have quite realistic uh, depictions, if you like, down to hair follicles of creatures which of course don't exist, but very much exist in our imagination, in both our fantasy and our fears. We have just one painting by Ralph Hotary in this auction, but, uh, but boy, what a painting it is. Uh, from 1976. It's entitled The Wind One, and it is of course from his iconic series of song cycle banners. Now I think there was, there was maybe 16 or 17 song cycle banners, but really in two distinct bodies. And this particular work, I think, is right up there among the most important of the song cycle banners ever to come on the market, and perhaps by extension one of the most important Hotary paintings ever to come on the market. It is an absolute beauty. It's been in a collection deep in the South Island since it was purchased from Bossard Galleries in 1976-1977 and has come to market through us for the first time. The Germans have this wonderful expression, Gesamtkunstwerk. You might have seen it turned up a little bit, it's frequently talked about in contemporary art. But this is really, I think, uh, Hotary's attempt from the mid-1970s to realise that lofty ambition of, of Gesamtkunstwerk or the total artwork. An artwork that would be more than just painting. An artwork that uh, might occupy a space, might occupy a given moment, in a way that a simple framed painting cut off from the world can never do. These particular works take their inspiration from the poetry of Bill Manheyer. One of the key things we think about when we think about Ralph Hoder is obviously his collaborative work with New Zealand poets. They were designed as a backdrop for a performance at the Sound Movement Theatre. In a domestic environment, they do get the most wonderful sense of movement through them. When the wind just catches them lightly, they positively just uh, jingle and dance like a performance in themselves. In this, this beautiful painting, I think the artist has come as close as possible, perhaps in New Zealand art history, to create a work that transcends mere painting um, into elements of performance, poetry, song and dance. This pristine and fascinating canvas by Rick Killeen from 1976 really stands at the crossroads of the artist's career. Not much more than a year later, the cutouts emerged. One of the most distinctive and unique bodies of work in all of New Zealand art. We would have all seen them, there's one in this catalogue. Now the first of the cutouts included a mixture of striking insect forms and abstract shapes in black and red, very much paired back. A year earlier, we can anticipate the cutouts arriving with this canvas here, Peabone. 
It's a work of great humour, but also great knowledge and awareness of both modernist practice and contemporary art movements as they were in the mid-1970s. We see here in this extraordinary eye-popping visual grid the influence of pop art from the 1960s, but also, of course, we see Gordon Walters and his Marquesan and Polynesian forms coming through. At the same time, we see these wonderful insect forms, the fly, the butterfly, and the bug there, that we have come to so readily associate with, with Rick Colleen's work. And wrapping them together to find meaning can be a little bit difficult. And I think the title Peebo is a clue for us. Peebo, along with Raid and Mortin, you'll remember the ads from back in the day, was an insect spray. So here we have, I think, Colleen humorously suggesting that one form of image making, pure abstraction, is perhaps about to erase uh, the more traditional realism and detail of the illustrated form. The meaning may well be elusive in our interpretations of work like this, but what we see, of course, is Colleen's wonderful way with constructing a canvas and an image.